It's from a chapter called The Rite of Passage. The feathers down her front are the color of sunned newsprint of tea-stained paper, and each is marked darkly towards its tip with a leaf-bladed spearhead. So from her throat to her feet, she is patterned with a shower of falling raindrops. Her wings are the color of stained oak, their covert feathers edged in palest teak, barred flight feathers folded quietly beneath. And there's a strange gray tint to her that is felt rather than seen, a kind of silvery light Oh, I've lost, I've lost the place. A kind of silvery light, like a rainy sky reflected from the surface of a river. She looks new, looks as if the world cannot touch her, as if everything that exists and is observed rolls off like drops of water from her oiled and close-packed feathers. I never, I never lose my place. That was, a, that was extraordinary. That was a moment of, uh, moment of tension. After the discussion this morning, few of us seem to be so frustrated with all the problems and the difficulties in environment and nature. We thought we start with something beautiful. So this was a description of a bird, our tribute to our invisible guest of honor tonight, a feathered guest. We will talk about later on this evening with extraordinary Helen McDonald, uh, which was introduced as famous as a global, global superstar. Robert said, "I'm kind of it? squirming in my seat now." So I think this <laughs> is worth a real applause to welcome her. <laughs> Thank you, Cornelia. It's hard to imagine that you haven't met Mabel so far, but if you haven't read H, like Hawk, you're very lucky, because you can looking forward to meet Mabel with this breathtaking hybrid, this book which is a mixture of science and narration of psychology and autobiography, of allergy and nature history, of nonfiction, but also with an extremely poetic glance. You one can feel that you are a poet as well. So it's a really extraordinary book of nature writing, this term, this genre that we questioned since yesterday. And all this evening we will ask for the characteristics of this genre, for the skills you need, although for the relationship between human beings and animals. And it's really my pleasure and my honor to host you, Helen. I'm very happy about it. Helen MacDonald, a historian at Cambridge, with a good humor you will recognize this evening, uh, which is necessary in these dark times, a naturalist and falconer from childhood, an author and poet, also with radio dramas and documentaries at BBC, uh, an author who introduces us to feral creatures like hawks and falcons, who leads us through the English landscapes, bush and covert, taking us hunting with falcons and uh, in falcon swoops of 320 kilometers an hour guiding us through the psychology of a hawk, but also inside her own wilderness, we can see. She's teaching us observation, perception, patience, she learned from her father, combining science, psychology, psychology and literature, bewitching us, with an incredible elegant style, in poems like Shayla's Fish or in a couple of books we are talking about tonight and which are also translated into German, Falken, Falke, Biografie eines Räubers und H wie Habicht, Age like Hawk. The last one is a bestseller, three times awarded and deluged with elegies. So it's really a delight to have you here and maybe you can explain first what makes this fascination? When did you fall in love that you deal with birds, with raptors, almost a lifetime? Yeah, this is the bit where I say embarrassing things about myself. Um, so when I wrote this book, um, I realized quite quickly that to write it, I had to be really open and honest about my emotional landscape. Um, I had to be really Californian. And um, 
and I put some things in there that even now I'm slightly embarrassed about. When I was a child, I was so bewitched and obsessed by raptors, by birds of prey, that when I was six, for a while, I tried to sleep with my arms behind my back like wings. Oh, it still burns, the embarrassment. Um, and I, I used to try and pray to the Egyptian god Horus at school assemblies when we did uh, the Lord's Prayer. I mean, I was, I was nuts about hawks. Uh, my friends had pictures of pop stars on their bedroom walls. I had photographs of kestrels. Um, I thought they were the most beautiful things the world had ever made. And I think I probably still do think that. Um, I don't know if any of you have read the or seen the film Kes, the Ken Loach film, based on an extraordinary book by Barry Hines about this little kid who is rejecting the life that he's been handed as a, you know, in a mining community. And he has this kestrel, and it's his secret. It's this tender thing he can love. And he tells his teacher that when the kestrel flies, everything goes quiet. And I think that's a perfect way to describe this almost religious awe that I had for them as a child. Did it also help that you grew up on the countryside? Yeah, I had a really strange upbringing, um, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, so my parents were both journalists, and they bought a tiny house on a strange little place called Teckles Park. It was in a town, but it was an estate that was owned by the Theosophical Society. And it was full of astonishing old, older ladies who had, you know, were very mystical and it was full of Italian gardens and ponds and meadows and woods, and it was perfectly safe, and I spent my entire childhood just running around, you know, being a naturalist. You know, I used to bring snakes home. My parents weren't particularly impressed by that. Um, I had aquariums in my, in my bedroom. Um, and the, the ladies around, you know, the older ladies, some of them were from Germany. They had come, you know, before the war because, you know, um, Theosophy was banned, and some of them were spies, some of them were concert pianists, and they were all completely potty and wonderful. And I, I think that was a very important thing for me. It made me realize that I didn't have to live my life the way that people told me I should. So I ended up being quite eccentric too. But um, yeah, I got my first kestrel when I was 12, I think, 11 or 12, way too young. Um, she was called Amy, and she nested on my bedroom bookcase. My parents were so long-suffering, you would not believe. I said, I'm going to be a falconer when I grow up. I'm going to be a falconer. My mum was like, are you sure you wouldn't rather be a lawyer? I think she said it twice. But, um, yeah, so they were, they were intense. I mean, at one point I had a badger cub. I mean, I was, yeah, I was living this bizarre life. Um, and you were wonderful. also working at the breeding station? Later on, I did an English degree at Cambridge. Um, Cambridge is an eccentric place, but frankly, after my upbringing, it was nothing. Um, and then after my English degree, I went and I worked at a falcon breeding and conservation centre, as you do after an English degree. And uh, I had a great time there. I worked a little bit in the Middle East. Um, and something happened there. I began to realize that a lot of the conservation initiatives to try and protect falcons, which are used traditionally by Bedouin and by the royal families um, in the Gulf states, the conservation initiatives were failing over and over again because they didn't take into account the deep emotional and cultural meaning these hawks had for the people that they were, they were, they were flying them. And that's when I really thought, I'm going to go back to university and I'm going to try and work out how and why we value animals the way we do. And yeah. that was the reason you wrote your book about falcons? Yeah, yeah, I wrote this book. Um, I was meant to be writing a PhD, but, you know, things happened. Um, <laughs> What I, kind of things? Well, laziness, partly. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I went to, for example, I went to this um, extraordinary archive in Idaho. It was a bit of a shock for me. I arrived um, in Idaho. You know, I'm a good, you know, fairly left-wing person, and... I turned up, and in the airport, there were hum there's a display of Humvees and gun safes and American flags, and I thought, oh, this probably isn't like home. Um, I was told not to go into certain shops because Californians were going in them, and Californians, you know, we don't want them here. They, you know, they, they come over here, they're liberals. It was extraordinary uh, education, actually, going over there. It was be I met some good friends. But I spent time in these archives, and it was full of stories and things I couldn't put in a PhD. So, for example, the story of Vern Seifert, who used to fly falcons in New York City in the 19, uh, 1940s, I think, early 40s. And um, there were a lot of mafia people keeping pigeons in New York City at the time. And what they would do, is they'd, they'd have these flocks that would fly, and they'd attract birds from other flocks. And the point was to get as many birds as possible. It was very competitive. But Vern's peregrine kept killing the pigeons. And um, he was warned. They said, we're going to put a hit on you. You get out of town. You take your peregrine with you. So stories like that aren't going to go into a PhD but they could go into a book. So I wrote this book, um, which is The Cultural History of Falcons, and it's, to me, a slightly excruciating read because it's kind of halfway between academic speak and ordinary speak. So it's, um, but it's got some great photographs and I think some lovely stories in it, and it was wonderful fun to do. And before we talk more about falcons and your book, 
you might read yeah. the passage. Yeah, I should read a bit of this. She brought her library, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the chapters in here is, is quite um, sort of straightforwardly natural history. And I think we've been talking a little bit about empathy and about animals and what they need. And I think I'm going to read this bit because it's about what, an, what a falcon, what is, it, what is it like to be a falcon? Claiming to understand the life world of another person is philosophically suspect. But for a different animal, the attempt is perhaps absurd, but undeniably fascinating. Our common sense anthropomorphism suggests that the world the falcon experiences is probably rather like ours, only more acutely perceived. But from the available evidence, it seems that the falcon's sensory world is as different from ours as that of a bat or a bumblebee. Their high-speed sensory and nervous systems give them extremely fast reactions. Their world moves about 10 times faster than ours. So events in time that we perceive as a blur, like a dragonfly zipping past our eyes, are much slower to them. Our brains cannot see more than 20 events a second. Falcons see 70 to 80 events a second. They're unable to recognize the 25 pictures per second moving image on a TV screen. Having said that, <laughs> there was an advert for the famous grouse whiskey. I probably shouldn't give brand names here. Uh, at Christmas, and Mabel was fascinated by it. So for some reason, she could recognize a grouse on television. <laughs> so the, the way that falcons and hawks can see things closer together in time means that when they stretch out their foot to grab a... a a bird or a butterfly or a, or a dragonfly, you know, that's normal time for them. You know, they live so much faster than ours. When fixing their eyes on an object, falcons, okay, this is going to happen a lot. I will start doing the, the movements. I might flap my arms later. You'll just have to forgive me. <laughs> when they fix their eyes on an object, falcons characteristically bob their head up and down several times. In so doing, they're triangulating the object using motion parallax to ascertain distance. Their visual acuity is astonishing. A kestrel can resolve a two-millimeter insect at 18 meters away. How is this possible? Partly through the size of the eyes. These are so huge that the back of each oar presses into the other in the middle of the skull. The retina hasn't got any vascular systems, obvious vascular systems invisible to prevent shadows or light scattering. And instead of blood vessels, nutrients are supplied to the retinal cells from projecting pleated structure called the pectin. Falcon's visually sensor sensory cells, the rods and cones, are far more densely packed than ours. We have around 30,000 cones in the most sensitive part of our eyes, the, the fovea, and raptors have around one million. They're basically just better than us, actually. I don't know why I went to all this. They're just better. But not only do falcons see more clearly than humans, they also see things differently. They're believed to see polarized light, useful for navigating in cloudy skies. They also see ultraviolet. Overall, falcons have a radically different phenomenal world. Humans have three different receptor sensitivities in their eyes, red, green, and blue. Everything we see is built from those three colors. Falcons, like other birds, have four. We have three-dimensional color vision. They have four. It's hard to comprehend. Dr. Andy Bennett, researcher in the field of bird vision, considers the difference between human and bird vision as being of the same order as that between black and white and color television. In the barest of functional terms, a falcon is a pair of eyes set in a well-armed, perfectly engineered airframe. Thank you. Falcons are the fastest animals we learn. Yeah, they're really cool. In fact, I always love, I always love falcons most. These, the, 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 the falcons and hawks are like dogs and cats. They're very different. In fact, when I try and explain to people the difference, I'm like, you know, it's very hard not to use military aviation metaphors. So falcons are kind of fighter jets, and um, goshawks are Apache attack, low-level attack helicopters. But that doesn't always work. So I've, I've ended up <laughs> describing falcons as, you know, lovely people, and basically goshawks are the Christopher Walkens of the bird world. That's... Um, <laughs> You started your book with an experiment. Um, Speed-suited skydiver yeah, was Franklin. supposed to follow a female peregrine, frightful, from the height of 16,000 Yeah, he jumped feet. out of 16,000 feet out of a plane with a speed suit to go even faster. And a mission impossible. It was, very much so. And what was amazing about that is as the falcon fell, they, um, they first of all turned into a teardrop shape and they're doing sort of 180 miles an hour. And then Ken got a little bit 
you know, faster. He, he drew away, and they were filming this falcon, and it did this astonishing thing. It looked like it was kind of shrink-wrapped at this point. It was so much being buffeted by the air, and it shrugged one shoulder forward, and somehow that managed to, managed to break through the air, uh, the flow around it, and it just dropped. It was doing, I think, 220 miles an hour, um, which is pretty fast. You're sure you haven't been a falcon in your previous life? <laughs> no, I don't think I was a falcon in a previous life. I'm far too lazy and, uh, yeah. No. Falcons, however, they are natural essence, became um, mystic and mythologic uh, symbols from the Egyptian god Horus, you already mentioned, oh, yeah. to Hollywood's Maltese falcon, from Arabian courts, to Iran, to Spain of the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. to Hermann Göring, mm -hmm. Sigmund Freud, yeah. even to the football teams in America today. Even a terrible car called the Ford Falcon, which apparently was the worst car ever built. Um, <laughs> you drive wish it? Wishful thinking that was in America <laughs> in the 50s. Um, yes, I mean, the, it's been used to, um, it's been given, it's Falcon given the name to so many different concepts and brands and, 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 and totem animals in various parts of the world. And it's Where astonishing. Where does this miso misologic, um, mm power comes from? Just from the speed? Well, I mean, I've, I spoke to a Russian anthropologist who told me that he believes there was a cult of birds of prey right across prehistoric Central Asia and Eurasia, right away across. And that cult saw falcons in particular, but also other hawks as um, human souls. So if you look at uh, gravestones of, of fallen warriors, they tend to have a falcon above their head, um, carved. Um, they're a uh, numerous, numerous uh, mythico-religious um, traditions of falcons being somehow related to your soul leaving you. I mean, you go to the Norse um, Yggdrasil, you know, the world tree had a couple of falcons on top. Um, they're everywhere. And the, one of the um, uh, Egyptian creation myths was that there was a blank nothingness and a stick came out of the water. I love the stick. Where did the stick come from? I thought to myself. But anyway, the stick comes out of the water and a falcon comes down and lands. And when the falcon lands, the water recedes and the world is made. So, I mean, they're, they're pretty amazing. Um, and I, one of my favorite things in the book is the, is the way that Falcon has decided to try and encourage the US Air Force to use the, the academy to use falcons as their mascot. And um, I think an eagle, was, an eagle was the other possibility. And uh, the sergeant stood up and said, you know, the falcon has a you know, dive speed of 200 miles an hour. It's noble and fierce and, and eagles are scavengers. You will now vote. So they, they, they've just been used to naturalize so many strange things, including a lot of military stuff as well. Did people, believe, did people just mirror human characteristics in falcons? Or did they believe they could transform speed, power, independence, all this? Yes, nice all, those, all those things we have seen in falcons. Um, partly through watching their behavior. But then, of course, once you believe that's what a falcon's like, the more you look at falcons, the more you put that behavior back into the falcon. I mean, you need to know a falcon pretty well before you realize that their peregrine falcons are quite dumb. <laughs> Shh. Uh, it's quite interesting, actually. If you speak to some Arab falconers, they'll say that a peregrine looks at you, but, oh no, a peregrine looks through you, but a sacred falcon looks at you, you know? Yeah, peregrines are kind of, yeah, they're not very clever. So, didn't really answer the question, but I just wanted to be a bit, you know, iconoclastic here. You read the chapter, um, what is it like to be a falcon? How do you know? You don't know. You have no idea. But um, you, why do you do the attempt? To I learn? think, um, I remember when I was very small, my brother too, we had our, the, the usual dinosaur obsession. I think young children have this wonderful, um, they, they have this the inclination to have crazes about things that involve carving the world at the joints, you know, taxonomies. Um, particularly big, fierce things, I think dinosaurs, you know, quite often. I remember famously, someone told me that they had a couple of boys and a daughter, and the, the boys liked Tyrannosauruses and the girls liked Stegosauruses, and she was really hacked off by this. But um, these animals become representations of kinds of power, um, kinds of um, ways of being in the world, and they become kind of cookie cutters for notions of who we can be. It's extremely powerful. We do it all the time. We do it unconsciously. You describe many uh, examples how people mingle with these animals. What are the consequences to put that together, nature and so-called civilization, human civilization? Yeah, there's a... I mean, I think that one of the things that falconry has done, particularly in the 19th century, when it became a very masculine, elite kind of activity, was that, you know, people had put into these creatures all the qualities that were considered to be the exemplary qualities of masculinity. So they were fierce, they were proud, they were noble. 
Um, they were kind of aristocratic, um, and they were death dealers. Uh, you know, they, they had the ability to give life and death. And um, so when a, you know, an aristocratic chap trained or tried to tame a falcon or a hawk, what was happening was that he was trying to kind of repossess those qualities by association with the bird. And at the same time, he was kind of civilizing the bird. It's basically a kind of imperialist fable, writ, you know, writ in a kind of very, very small, small kind of way. It's a very interesting, very interesting one. It's a strange thing that uh, people adore falcons so much, and on the other way, they are exploited, they are instrumentalized. Are, uh, and falcons are even also endangered species. They're doing better. So, um, you know, I think back to ancient Egypt, where you know, hundreds of thousands of falcons were, were killed and mummified and put into and stacked in rows in, in temples, um, although apparently some of them were fakes. But um, So, you know, and I think, you know, you, There was a terrible problem with um, pesticide poisoning in the 1960s and 70s. Um, we've sorted that out. And now peregrines are becoming the urban bird par excellence. You know, they, they, you know, they see the, the city in functional terms as a kind of set of cliff faces uh, full of pigeons. I mean, there are now peregrines everywhere. And in fact, when I go to New York now, I'm quite bored of them. Um, so, but something special about that is this. I think when we are start to believe that nature is something out there. To see something spectacular and wild and big, we have to travel. And um, I've spoken to office workers in America who've you know, been sitting away typing, you know, having their lunch, and suddenly there's a thump and they turn around and on the window there's a dead pigeon and there's a peregrine sitting there five feet away looking right at them. And what astonishes me about that is not just that it gives the lie to the sense that you have to travel to see spectacular nature, but the fact that they instantly tend to see it as a extremely spiritual moment. It becomes a deeply meaningful exchange of gazes. And people have told me that it's changed their life, you know. Um, it's, it's very, they're just, they're very resonant creatures. You were talking about the... But I'm biased. <laughs> you were talking about the 19th, 20th century, the masculine tradition. But before, in the 11th century, 12th century, it was a female thing? Yeah, John of Salisbury said that... Uh, The weaker sex excel in the training and hunting of hawks. Yes, I don't know about the weaker sex bit, but um, and they weren't just hunting with with small birds. They were flying jer falcons and goshawks, these big birds, you know. Um, but something happened in the in the 18th and 19th centuries. I think what partly to do with the fact that open air spaces spaces where hunting took place were generally started to become restricted to to men, um, and women tended to become drawn more into the domestic sphere. And it's you know it's kind of very strange that. You know, in the 1920s, there were really no women falconers at all. There's loads of us now, though, so I'm happy. Falconry uh, that you learned as a child um, has such a long tradition, and it's, today it's an immaterial um, UNESCO World Heritage. Yeah. How would you describe the relation between a falconer and its animal, his animal? Okay, so it's very important to say that it's not one of... People often think it's founded on domination and subjection. It's not like that at all. And I'm, I know that I'm, you, know, you think I'm trying to persuade you. The best description of falconry that I've ever heard was from the writer Stephen Bodio, who's also a falconer. And he said, falconry is learning how to be polite to a bird. And that just captures it more than anything else. You know, you have this creature who... Um, you have to win its trust through positive reinforcement to the point where you will go outside with it, it will fly off, it will fly around, it will you know, do all its stuff, and it will decide it would quite like to come back with you at the end of the day. So, you know, in my, in my heart, I think, of all animal-human relationships with wild animals, I think falconry could be one of the most enlightened if it's done right. Obviously, you know... Could be a model for It could treating. be, if, it, if it's done right. But, I mean, a lot of people, you know, are not doing it right, and that is difficult for me, you know, but... Um, so interesting thing for me was all the, the vocabulary of falconry. Um, and there's a difference between the German and the English version. The English version says, a f t it t t t well, talks about taming a falcon. There are special expressions in German. And I was wondering, because language is forming identity, whether that made any change for you, for your writing, for your behavior, to deal with this uh, strange vocabulary. The falconry vocabulary in English, um, oh, I used to glory in it. Um, it was one of those things that you've, back in the early modern period, if you didn't know your falconry vocabulary, you were, you know, socially dead, you know. And there's a wonderful story of a Jesuit spy who was terrified of being found out because he kept forgetting his falconry terms. So these were, when I was a small, these were magic terms to me. They were terms that no one else that I knew understood, you know. Um, I don't quite know why, but I mean, I, I, I was delighted to know that 
you know, falcon's talons are called pounces and their tummies are called, you know, panels and their wings are called sails. Um, and I knew also that I delighted in the fact that a lot of these terms have become uh, used in modern English. So, you know, to, to booze, the wonderful term to, to get drunk or to get to drink, is what, what falcons do, they booze. Um, what other ones are they? Hoodwinked, you know, it's from when you put a hood over a hawk's head to keep it, you know, make it go to sleep. So, yeah, it's this history, history really in hearing in these, these, these little nuggets of vocabulary that, uh, you know, have lost their origin. Human beings mirrored themselves in falcons. You, did ev you even went one step further with the hawk. You identified with the hawk, and we talk about this book, H is for a Hawk, after your reading. Yeah, it's, um, it's a story about, I will say it's a story about a miserable woman, a dead author, and a bird. That's what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> we start uh, with uh, one of the central scenes in the book, a hunt. Yeah. This is quite a long reading. If you get bored, just shout and I'll stop. <laughs> you won't. <laughs> <laughs> so just to say, um, I felt, you know, I, I decided to train a gospel as a way of dealing with the grief I felt after my father's sudden death. I don't recommend this, generally. Don't do this. Um, and I fell into an extraordinary state, which was deep depression. I didn't feel like that. Over-identification with the bird. And for the first time in my life, I knew I wanted this bird to hunt because I wanted it to be as natural a life for the bird as possible. And I was running away from death as fast as I could, and yet suddenly the hawk was presenting with it and catching its own dinner. So this is, this is possibly the hardest part of the book, actually, to read. So <sighs> the chapter's called Fear, delightfully enough. It was always there, kneeling by Mabel on her prey, that the thoughts came. When I wondered how I could be doing this, how I could be hunting at all, I hate killing things. I'm loath to tread on spiders and get laughed at for rescuing flies. But now I understood for the first time what bloodthirstiness was all about. It was only when I was aligned with the hawk's eye that it made sense. But then it made more sense than anything else in the world. When I saw birds fly overhead, I turned my head and followed them with a kind of longing. Hunting with the hawk took me to the very edge of being a human. Then it took me past that place to somewhere I wasn't human at all. The hawk in flight, me running after her, the land and the air a pattern of deep and curving detail, sufficient to block out anything like the past or the future, so that the only thing that mattered were the next 30 seconds. I felt the curt lift of autumn breeze over the hill's round brow, and the need to tack left, to fall over the leeward slope to where the rabbits were. I crept and walked and ran. I crouched, I looked. I saw more than I'd ever seen. The world gathered about me. It made absolute sense. But the only things that I knew were hawkish things. And the lines that drew me across the landscape were the lines that drew the hawk. Hunger, desire, fascination, the need to find and fly and kill. Yet every time the hawk caught an animal, it pulled me back from being an animal into being a human again. That was the great puzzle, and it was played out again and again. How hearts do stop. A rabbit prostrate in a pile of leaves, clutched in eight gripping talons, the hawk mantling her wings over it, tail spread, eyes burning, nape feathers raised in a tense and feral crouch. And then I reached down and put my hand on the bunched muscles of the rabbit, and with the heel of one hand at the back of its head, where the fur was soft and tawny, I'd pull once, twice, hard on its back legs, with the other breaking its neck. A fit of kicking and the eyes filming over, I had to check the rabbit was dead by very gently touching its eye, everything stopping, stopping, stopping. I had to do this. If I didn't kill the rabbit, the hawk would sit on top of it and start eating. And at some point in the eating, the rabbit would die. That is how goshawks kill. The borders between life and death are somewhere in the taking of their meal. I couldn't let that suffering happen. Hunting makes you animal, but the death of an animal makes you human. Kneeling next to the hawk and her prey, I felt a responsibility so huge that it battered inside my own chest, ballooning out into a space the size of a cathedral. For years I'd explained that I'd rather eat hawk-caught food than things that had had a blind and crowded life in a barn or battery cage. One minute the rabbit's there, twitching its nose in a field that smells of nettles and grassy roots, then it is running, and then it is caught, and then it is dead. I've told people that there are no injuries in hawking. Either things are caught or they escape. 
And I told them, too, that nothing is wasted. Everything the hawk catches is eaten by the hawk and me. If you choose to eat meat, I'd said, this is the best way I know to get it. But these arguments seemed petty now and pointless. They had nothing to do with what it was like to be there with a hawk and a caught rabbit that twitched and kicked and died and the world biting into me, the serious everything puzzle that was death and going away. But how could you, people asked. Someone said it was a way of destroying the world a piece at a time after my father's death. Were the rabbits you, someone asked. No. <laughs> Were you killing yourself? No. Were you sorry? Yes. But the regret wasn't that I had killed an animal. It was regret for the animal. I felt sorry for it. Not because I felt I was better than the animal. It, uh, it wasn't a patronizing sorrow. It was the sorrow of all deaths. I was happy for Mabel's success, and I mourned the individual rabbit. Kneeling by its corpse, I'd feel a sharp awareness of my edges, the rain prickling on my collar, a pain in one knee, the scratches on my legs and arms from pushing myself through a hedge that had not hurt till now, and a sharp, wordless comprehension of my own mortality. Yes, I will die. I learned that momentary shouldering of responsibility that allowed me to reach down and administer the coup de grace to a rabbit held tight in Mabel's feet. A part of me had to click into place, and it's hard. And <laughs> a part of me had to click into place, and there was another part of me I had to put far away. There's no better phrase than the old one to describe it. You have to harden your heart. I learned that hardening the heart was not the same as not caring. The rabbit was always important. Its life was never taken lightly. I was accountable for these deaths. For the first time in my life, I wasn't a watcher anymore. I was being accountable to myself, to the world, and all the things in it. But only when I killed. The days were very dark. They darkened further. This is easier now. <laughs> Driving back to the house one afternoon, I passed a huddle of walkers staring at a rabbit crouched in a, gr in a grassy verge on the other side of the road. They were upset. Their shoulders were hunched in concern. I pulled in a little, a little further up the road and I watched them and waited. I didn't want to talk to them, but their concern pulled at me. They knew the rabbit was sick and they wanted to do something, but no one knew what that could be and no one was brave enough to get near it. For minutes on end, they stared at it, unable to intervene, unwilling to leave. Then they walked on. When they were gone, I got out of the car and went up to the little lump of fur. It was a small rabbit. Its muscles were wasted, its head covered in tumors, its eyes swollen and blistered. It was matted with mud. It could not see. Oh, rabbit, I said, I'm so sorry. Leaning down, I hardened my heart and put it out of its misery. The rabbit had myxomatosis. I'm going to much of this bit. You know, this, this was introduced to Britain in the 1950s, and suddenly we had tens of millions of rabbit corpses everywhere. Um, it had enormous ecological effects um, in the country, um, but they are sort of they're, they're increasing a bit more. They're being hit by other viruses, but basically, yes, rabbits had a bad time and still do. That small rabbit sat huddled in my mind. It would not go away. It felt like a revenant, something pulled from the past, from back when I was small and the countryside was in crisis. It wasn't just the hawks dying. Rabbits dying. <laughs> Sorry. Hawk populations were in free fall from agricultural pesticides. Skeletal elm trees were chopped down and burned. The otters were gone. Rivers were poisoned. There were guillemots drowning in oiled seas. Everything was sick. And we'd be next. I knew it. All of us. I knew that one morning we'd, there'd be a siren, then a double flash of light on the horizon, and I'd look up and see a distant mushroom cloud. And then on the wind, the fallout would come. Invisible dust and then everything would be dead. Or we'd go back to the Stone Age and live in rags, huddled around the ruins and smoking fires. But even that slim dream of survival was dashed. Are we going to build a nuclear reactor in the gar a nuclear fallout shelter in the garden? Asked my parents one day, afternoon, after school. They looked at each other. Maybe they didn't understand, I thought, so I went on. In the leaflet, it says we should build a shelter under the stairs, and there's not very much room under ours for you and me and James and Dad. There was a long pause and they gently told me that our house was very close to several very important military targets. There's no point worrying, they said. There'll be no fallout. If there's a war, we won't even know about it. We'll be instantly vaporized. <laughs> this, needed to say, did not help at all. 
I scratched my name on bits of slate and buried them as deep as I could in the garden under the earth. Maybe they would su survive the apocalypse. Thank you. Yeah? Thank you very much. The best is when Helen reads, but if you want to read yourself and more, there's few copies outside with Wordsworth. And if you want to read it in German, I recommend Falken, translated by Frank Sievers, and Hawk by Ulrike Kretschmer. Um, Hawk is, as you mentioned, it's a memoir. Or at least this is there one are, There of are moments of lightness in it, I want to just tell you. <laughs> <laughs> <It's not laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a memoir. We heard the, right in the beginning the beautiful descriptions of the birds, for example. Um, Hawk is like, um, as I said before, a hybrid. It's made of at least three or four elements. It's a memoir that starts with the death of your father and, that, and your attempt to cope with the grief. It's a very poetic uh, piece on nature writing with excursions in culture history. And it's a mini biography uh, of T.H. Uh, White, a writer of the 30s, a uh, gay, a sadist, a difficult person, leaving civilization, retired, completely tried to tame a hawk, failed and left to books, uh, Art, um, yes, Arthur's the novel and The Goshawk about his failing tame, yeah. Your book starts with the death of your father and um, the funeral and a strange dream where you decided I have to tame a hawk. Why not a falcon? You were in falconry before. Um, yeah, I basically because um, I needed a challenge. Um, goshawks are famously difficult to tame. Um, they are um, generally described as murderous, nervous, highly strung, terrible creatures. Um, and the thing about falcons is that they are very calm and placid creatures, and they're very easy to get to like. You know, you tend to become quite friendly with each other. Um, and goshawks were everything that I felt inside myself at that time. I was full of the rage of grief, the wildness of grief. It's an uncontrollable feeling, as you know, if you've been bereaved. And um, I think some part of me thought, I can't tame this grief, but I, could, I can definitely tame a hawk. <laughs> and I knew that it would be all-consuming. Um, the psychological and emotional and physical um, stress of training. I mean, it's, it's, it's the most um, all-encompassing um, experience I think I've, I've ever had in my life is taming hawks, you know. On the other hand, nature and an animal is a very familiar motive as a healer. Did you have that in your mind? That too. So that, I think, later on, after I, Mabel was basically friends with me, um, she turned out not to be quite what the book said. We ended up watching TV together and playing. I used to throw bits of paper in a scrunch into balls and she'd throw them back to me. And I, I, this is like great. I told my friends that flew goshawks about this and they were horrified. They said, you don't play with goshawks. Um, later I discovered that they all do, they just don't talk about it. Um, <laughs> So later on when I was flying her, um, there was certainly a sense that I thought that getting out into the countryside every single day would somehow salve my hurts. It was the famous chestnut, right? That if you're broken or you're grieving, nature will heal you. And um, yeah, I, I, I have, there's a lot of sense in that. And it is true that nature will, in many cases, give you solace and, and, and give you space to breathe and, and heal. But as usual, I just went way too far. Um, I basically, in my head at that point, it's embarrassing to admit, but I was so close to that hawk, I didn't see anyone else. Um, I ran after her, she flew. I thought I was the goshawk. I thought I was a hawk. And I remember one point, uh, there was a hammering on the door and it was the mailman and I hid, un hid behind the sofa. I mean, like, it was... But before you transformed and before you played with paper balls, you had to tame her, you had yeah. to get used to her, mm -hmm. and you learned the body language. And I found it very in interesting that you describe um, the feathers tied, I'm afraid. How do you know? And the funny thing is, you write, I, you, are, you had already transformed. Exactly, right. Uh, I, I, the more you watch a creature, the more that becomes a language you understand. There's, I was saying that there's a wonderful story, there was a, there's a book about black-headed gull colonies. I really am going full anorak geek nerd here by F.B. Uh, F. Kirkman, written in the 1920s. And this chap 
decided he was going to sit in a black-headed gull colony, so hundreds of nests of these gulls around him, and study their behavior. And when he sat down to start with the first few days, he just sat there bored out of his mind. He didn't know, he didn't, you couldn't see anything. Nothing was happening, there were just birds everywhere, you know. But the longer he sat, the more he saw, and by the end of, I think he was there for two or three months, um, he didn't have the time to write down all that he saw because he had learned the language of those birds. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'd known hawks for a long time, but it's so delicate. In fact, with, it, with goshawks now, I realize that there are, there are these tiny feathers called crines around their beak and eye. They're cool, actually. They're, they're like hairs. And when they eat things that are bloody, the, the, the blood just flakes off them so they don't get you know, matted feathers. But there's an enormous amount of expression in those tiny, tiny hairs. And sometimes the, I could just watch one tiny, like four or five hairs hitch, and I thought, oh, she's in a good mood. I just, you know, I just knew. Yeah, you described yeah. there was human characteristics like cross, uh, or it has frown, frown lines down her jaw, or yeah, she, we she, strolled she, back, so <laughs> I I've like not, you would come I, from yeah. shopping. I mean, I've always found that the, the, the notion of animals as, as, as you know, robots. Um, I remember one, one guy once said to me, Animal, you know, animals don't enjoy having sex, they do it because they're programmed. I'm like, I, they probably do enjoy it. That might be part of why. They, <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I've always thought of animals as, as possibly not having the intellectual machinery of humanity, but having a very rich emotional life. And I think birds, certainly. Um, you know, I could be wrong, but I have a parrot now. I've gone down in the world. And um, it's like having a person in the house. I mean, you know, it's, it's the emotion of that bird. But isn't it only an illusion to have this osmotic? Not, not, I, not I think, if you... If you can build a relationship where both of you understand what the other being is trying to say. And I think that happened with Mabel and it happened with my parrot, yeah. Yeah, we heard that you even went hunting and shared the prey. Yeah, it was a dark time. I cooked my half though, right? I didn't eat mine raw. That would have been too much even for me. You said you are not bloodthirsty. I'm or not. You I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> If the apocalypse comes, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be all right probably. How did you recognize the wilderness inside of you with this bird? That's a really interesting question. Um, so going back to my very, very early life, um, one part of the reason I think that I was interested in birds of prey or animals was that I was a very lonely child. I had a twin brother who died just after he was born. I didn't know anything of his existence until I was 18. It was such a horrendous uh, trauma for my parents that they just didn't talk about it. And growing up all the time, I kept thinking that there was something that was missing. And I just assumed that everyone thought that. But it turns out, I think that a lot of my falconry intuitions, that sense of having a creature that will, all the psychotherapists in the audience are going to be laughing now, but a creature that can, is not yours, but it chooses to come back to you from the other side. You know, and I, the fact that falcons and hawks have been seen as human souls is perhaps, you know, it's a little bit woo woo, but it, it, it makes sense. Um, I've completely forgotten where we were going with that question. <laughs> Sorry, I just... I, w I was asking I that. The wildness inside mm -hmm. myself. Um, I think that grief, um, a big grief, makes you wild. Um, I think it's one of those... Th I think wildness in, is one of those incredibly contested terms. It's polysimus. It means all sorts of things. One of the things um, I think, to me, it means is that one acts in ways that one has no, or has emotional lows that one has no control over. That's a kind of wildness. That's your emotional and your biological and your physiological things doing things. I remember, I remember, you know, the most extraordinary physiological things. I was convinced that I would burn through chairs if I sat on them after my father died. I was hot all over. And that's something which is not in your conscious control. It's a kind of wildness. It's your body and your mind doing things that you, you know, you have no, it's not tame. But in the end, you realized um, even the hawk cannot heal, and the hands are not made just to hold perches. Yeah, human hands are not made for hawks alone. That's what that was. Uh, that was my moment of uh, rather poetic uh, revelation. I think there, um, they're just they, um, they, you know they're not perches for hawks. They're for people too. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's a book that isn't a book like you know I was sad and then I got a cat and then I was happy. Um, it was a complicated journey, right? I mean, that hawk... There was an amazing review of the book very early on um, by an amazing writer called Laura Beatty. And she said instantly, this book is a, it's a trip to the underworld and back. This is what it is. It's exactly like, you know, it's a classical myth kind of thing. You know, I, I, my father's gone. I try and follow him with the hawk to bring him back, and I can't. 
And she said, T.H. White is clearly the human shade that you have to have with you if you go into the underworld, otherwise you can't come back. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know any of that. But it, the, there is a sense, I think, that very old stories get told through you. You don't even know that they're In there. In some but cultures, yeah. uh, the, uh, the hawks are spirit messengers. Mm -hmm. And of course, it confronted you with death. We heard that yeah. in the hunt. Yeah. I came back changed, people. Um, but um, that's I'm, what I wanted to ask. Yeah. Oh, How? Um, I'm softer now. I think I love the world a lot more. Um, it's very embarrassing talking about myself, I guess. But um, I think I have been for the last hour, so I don't know why I said that. <laughs> um, I think that was that year was the first year, and it wasn't just my father's death. It was seeing you know my hawk hunting. I, I realized how deeply tiny and small and precious and short our lives are and that we could go at any moment and that inevitably made me love everything more you know it's um and it's made me softer and also i think i've kind of i'm slightly less introverted um i was very much a loner but it turns out there are lots of really nice people in the world and that sounds really cheesy but it's true so you know so it has it has changed me also i can pay my bills now from this book so my mum's very happy um <laughs> I must tell, can I tell the pizza story. So, so about a year ago, I had a pizza with my mother. She came to visit me in Cambridge, and um, this makes me sound like an awful person. So at the end of the meal, it was delicious. We had the famous mother-daughter argument of who's going to pay. She's like, I'll get this. And I'm like, no, no, I'll get this. And she's like, no, I'll get this. And it became quite heated. And I finally said to her, I'll get it. I'm rich. <laughs> I wasn't rich at that point, but you know, compared to how I was, I'm rich. And she looked at me with wonderful mother, mo narrow mothered eyes, and she said, for now. <laughs> My mother is brilliant. She just cuts it down to earth. Yeah, so um, it's, it's been a strange time. But. Before we talk about nature writing and what skills are necessary and what does it mean for you in a political way, mm. you wanted to read us a poem? Why not? Which is not translated into German? Yeah, I don't know if I can, but I, don't, that I can think follow. some of them are. Yes. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the poet. Is it Ulf Stotterf? Oh, I can't remember his name. Who's your name? There's a wonderful. Yes, wonderful man. Um, I went to a poetry workshop many years ago, and he does translate some. So, so um, he he found them very amusingly difficult. He kept saying, "Does this mean anything?" Um, it's a lovely man. I wish I wish I'd seen him. Um, okay, I'm going to find a poem. So these poems are in some ways a little bit like abstract expressionism on paper. Um, they were written by me when I was a student, so this is a little bit like reading teenage diaries for me. Um, it's quite embarrassing in some ways. Um, but what I was going to try to do with them was to take the cadences and um, structures of sort of lyric poetry, high romantic lyric, lyric poetry, and fill them with all sorts of things that shouldn't be there. So it was quite fun. Let me try and find a... Oh my goodness, this is not excellent. Sorry, I'll put this down. Yeah, this is one called Mine. Um, it's a strange one. It's sort of a bit of a war poem, um, but again, it doesn't, it's not maybe visibly so. Mine. The aim is fine-tune, gradual. The piece of heavy rain is owned, blinked to set resuscitation of vision, flashes of brilliance distant maybe recede. He is carrying dust, and his certainty was no one wished themselves to accompany him, dismissing the ground as level, discussing its ease of use. No, we will not hurt. The ground will fade into beauty as easily and the hasp of the air with lead as the figure of one who is carried by another, sand blowing through the wide, broken streets where frames are weak near the ocean. Warm gray air slides up the riverine edge, condensing on the grains, making them cohere. The figures persevere as differences in structure emerge. Distortions in vision induced by the sun. We could call them mirages rather than justifiable blunders of suspense. But now the figure is moving, and we deduce his plan from our own. Under stands of palm, the rattle of darkness held in pandanus rags hardly seems possible. This pool here, brilliant calm, is walking towards it, as if every imagined harm discarded the tiny surface tension of chlorinated warm blue and left it alone. The weakest thing peeling from the surface in long chains by the sun, plotting the destruction of some moment and time, movement, or its creation, the same 
witnessing the arc, of evaporative calm, watching the sand, the witless climb, the moving pool, the waterfall of glass, sun below fire, the returning man. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're still going. Especially in poetry, Germany has a long tradition in nature writing, but we don't have this term. Nature writing. <laughs> yeah. um, do you have an idea why this tradition is so strong in the Anglo-American literature, but not anywhere else? Oh, that's a huge question. Um, is it time? <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I start with a smaller question. I, no, 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 it's a very good question. Um, and I'm going to answer it, I think, in a very limited way, because it's such a huge question. I hope that's all right. And I'm going to talk about animal-human books. There's a very interesting... When I was a small girl, I used to love a whole set of books that came out in the 20th century, a little bit in the 19th century, and they were books about... They were sort of animal, animal memoirs written by the animals themselves. It's very strange. Um... And I remember when I was a kid trying to write some of these myself. So I remember writing an enormous story about what it was like to be a badger, you know. Um, and I think that some, one, of, one of the things I did with the Hawk book is I think I was sort of playing with that tradition of, of these strange books about, about animals, named animals that have the sort of uh, these lives. Um, but what I wanted to do with that book was to try and do something which I was hoping would be different from nature writing per se, which was to try and get away from um, there being just one voice in the book. So, um, and one genre, so I, you know, this is not answering a question again, but I'm, I'm on a roll now, so I'm going to keep going. So, so, as you say, there's lots of different genres in the book, and as the book goes on, to start with, they're, they're quite discreet. You have a chapter on nature writing, a chapter which is grief memoir, a chapter which is literary biography, but as the book goes on, all those different narratives start to crash into each other, and they start to fall apart. And um, I think I wanted to do that partly because it was a, I thought it was an interesting experiment, and partly also because I think that's what grief does. It destroys easy narratives. Um, but in terms of the sort of general genre, I mean, partly I think it's because Britain, as we discussed last night, is one of the most ecologically depauperate places in the world. And people of my age, I think we've lost 40% of all birds in Britain in the time I've been alive. And it's visible. And a lot of people my, people my age are, are bearing witness to that. And we want to change it. Um, and of course, also, there's, there's publishing involved. So I think, you know, nature writing seems to have there's a kind of snowball of, of, of publishing. Of you know, People want it. There's a great desire for it. We have programs on British television like Spring Watch, which is kind of like, um, I don't know, it's kind of soap opera with animals in nests. You know, it's like, will, will the jackdaws eat the mice? Will the barn owls die? <laughs> it's far too stressful for me. I can't watch it. <laughs> but um, I think that sense of animal narratives is a, is a weirdly, I mean, it's quite a, I, I don't have sufficient knowledge of other traditions in other languages, but it's a strangely British thing. But I think, you know, bird watching, bird watching is British and American, you know. Um, I, when I was in, a, when, it's quite a working class activity in Britain. When I was in America last, I went to Central Park during what they call a warbler fall, which meant that a lot of migrating birds suddenly sort of dumped down and it was full of birds, amazing, like running bushes everywhere. But it was full of bird watchers too. And in America, there's a, sort of tr there's a few hipster bird watchers. And I had a chat with some of them and they were proper hipsters. You know, they had the moustache things and the clothes and stuff, lots of wax and big white plastic glasses, they were very cool. And I'm like, what are they doing bird watching? And I talked to them for a while and they were really into it. And I realized that bird watching is actually the most extraordinary hipster cool thing because it involves, <laughs> it involves particularly in America where the warblers are all, almost indistinguishable from one another. Um, it involves very precise understandings of tiny variables. Otherwise you don't really know what, you know, you're, you're an idiot. You've got to really know the details to know what's really there. And it was just hilarious, this new culture of hipster birding. So, um, yeah, who knows? Your book I'm really not answering any of these questions, am I? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, your book, The Hawk, um, is interspersed with very uh, poetic descriptions of landscape as well. But the amazing thing is t exactly the description of birds, and it's very precise. Uh, I can, or you can read how long you were in the field and watching. Um, why do we do it so precisely? To sharpen our perception? Um, I, I take my, or the, the precision and the names I think are very important. I take my cue uh, when it comes to nature writing from uh, military techno thrillers. 
that's not what you expected me to say. But um, so if you if you if you open a Tom Clancy book about you know war stuff, um, you'll find that he'll talk about you know particular missiles and, and warheads and stuff, and he uses all the kind of jargon. And he doesn't explain what they are. You're supposed to know as the reader, right? So I, I, I guess I sort of think that being accurate, both in terms of what you see and what it is and not having to explain things, is in many ways is a generous act to a reader. Um, I like the fact that Google is at everyone's, you know, you know, in everyone's hand now. I mean, you know, if you don't know what it is, you can look it up in 12 seconds. So I think that you know, the advent of Google is, is a strangely liberating thing for a certain kind of writing. Um, yeah. I thought it was cool of perception to read that and to follow you in these descriptions because for many of us, nature is such a second-hand experience in the meantime via media. Uh, time is gone when Rilke, for example, in his prose, yes. described a protagonist uh, leaning at a tree, feeling the vibrance and feeling that he's getting to the other part of nature. Mm. How could nature writing reconnect us? Um, I think that's absolutely possible in one's head if one is careful that no one is watching you. <laughs> you can certainly feel that. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, there are lots of things to do with nature writing that I worry about. I worry about a certain kind of nativism, um, not in everyone's nature, but I mean, certainly there's these questions we talked about this morning about rewilding, this notion that there is a, you know, um, a time that we should all get back to um, in terms of ecological health is absolutely fine, but in other ways, um, I think, rests on imagined pasts for a nation which are problematic for me. Um, I, I do think it's possible to lose yourself in nature. I think you can do it in good ways and bad ways. I think you can, with my hawk, I entered this strangely wordless state. You know, I didn't remember the names for anything. When I looked at a tree, it wasn't, you know, an oak tree or an alder. Uh, I just, you know, felt like I was looking at all the individual leaves. It was a very strange, slightly druggy experience. Um, I think to lose some, some uh, oneself in nature is very, very easy. We really know that when we watch mountains, when we are yeah. on the mountains, when we see a little blackbird but in the how morning. Does, how does that fit with community and, and yeah. society is, is a big question. You know, I, 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 when I was young, I used to read books about nature were written in this extraordinarily authoritative voice, you know. This is this, and this is this, and I love that voice. You know, it was it was incredibly comforting to me that someone up there knew everything about the world. But I, you know, I begin to realize it's quite a problematic voice, and you fall into it so easily when you're writing about nature. I was wondering what's whether it's just a sentiment, uh, losing ourselves in nature. It's just a sentiment, or is it a real connection? It's it's something that I think is a way to thinking more carefully about what nature is, what you are, and what a, what a reconnection might be. I think all those things demand severe and very careful critical thought. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can lie, in, the gra lie in, a, in a grassy meadow on a spring day and feel like I'm part of the world. It's extraordinary, you know, but it, you need to think about the things too. Um, Sorry, I've got an itchy nose. Sorry. <laughs> this, morning, this morning was also discussed whether nature writing could should be an archive. You were talking about the people in the 40s, 50s, who know species which are not existing anymore. Mm. Would you say that's a task for yourself too, to extend this archive, also to extend the language? Um, you know, that the, these are always post hoc thoughts because I don't think of those things when I'm writing. It just seems to me very urgent that I get what I'm writing down in time for me not to be shouted at by my editor. But um, I'm being flippant because it's a very, very hard question. Um, I don't know. That's not a very good answer, but I don't know. <laughs> Living in this... It's not an answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, we, we have to give our, the answer ourselves. Living in the age of Anthropocene, um, you ha I think you have to have a kind of responsibility, and you were mentioned before, you want to do something against it, the, against the loss of birds, yeah. of species. What are you doing? Are you political active, or is it? I think I need to be more politically active, uh, frankly. Um, I think, like a lot of people that I know, um, recent political situation involving, you know, huge fight back against all the environmental sort of help, progress we've made over the, the, the bare amount of progress we've made, um, I think I've just became kind of paralyzed. You know, it's such a horrendous situation. Um, but I think 
it requires more action. And um, I don't know, who knows? I might be arrested in front of a bulldo bulldozer at some point. Um, but I mean, my, my, what I've been trying to do politically, I think, is, is kind of quite quiet, I guess. It's that um, I want to write things that a lot of, a lot of people might read. Um, I've worked you know, for the New York Times Magazine, which is an extraordinary um, platform and an amazing group of people, um, talking about how you know, wondrous the natural world is to try and you know, get that across, but at the same time trying to sift through um, the ways in which the natural world is always seen through the lens of our own needs and assumptions and trying to see why we value certain landscapes and animals the way we do. And that, that seems to me to try and understand why and what we value and why we do that and what we don't value as absolutely necessary politically for, um, for conservation and, and, and environmentalism. And you proclaim to teach natural history in school? I would love to, I would love to teach natural history in school. Yes, we should have more natural history. Um, <laughs> kids' brains, I mean, sorry, I'm going to be very general here, but kids really love, I mean, I, um, I have a, you know, a friend whose daughter has suddenly become obsessed with bugs. And, um, you know, I, that just gives me enormous pleasure. You know, kids are sort of, they're sort of made to kind of find out, find new stuff. You know, it doesn't have to be Pokemon. It can be real stuff. Um, I love Pokemon Go, though, so I'm not going <laughs> to... The two, the two worlds can be... I like to think that they can be coincident rather than totally apart. And I, you know, like, for example, you know, I, I know with my, with my own uh, iPhone, you know, I've been playing a lot of Match 3 games and uh, a lot of time on Twitter, but at the same time, I notice also that um, Twitter has become an extraordinary resource for naturalists. You know, people are posting stuff, what's this? Experts will, will weigh in and conversations will happen. So, you know, it's, it's not simply, you know, nature against culture. Before you're teaching, your next project will lead you to the Midlands? I'm hoping to... Um, what was I thinking? Actually, I'm very excited about it. I'm hoping to travel to a dot, a tiny coral dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean called Midway. Uh, many of you probably know this because of the albatrosses there. There's 1.2 million albatrosses or thereabouts on this place. And I want to write about grief, and I want to write about, again, and I write about guilt. Um, one of the reasons I think that I don't, you know, I, I read polemics about the disasters that are befalling the natural world, and I, I just, I feel so guilty, I run away. I want to just watch TV. So I want to think about guilt, and I think albatrosses are a very good way to do that. Um, <laughs> and it's an island that's doomed. It's going to go under the under the sea at some point, and it's an old naval base. There's a sort of ruins of the Second World War and later um, on there. And I think it's a book, it's going to be a book about love and loss and the end of the world. And I'm going to have to, you know, try and do my best to um, take those themes and, 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 and make them sing. Can you tell us more about this horrible situation of the albatrosses? Thing? Yes, it's very tough. So albatrosses, um, as you probably know, are these seabirds that spend, you know, days, weeks at sea. Um, they've often picked up in the past sort of driftwood with flying fish eggs on, so they will pick up solid stuff from the sea. Um, young albatrosses, for the first, you know, certain part of their life, cannot regurgitate stuff that they're fed. This happens later. So these, these albatrosses are bringing back plastic, um, big lighters, bottle tops, just scraps, you know, small soldier figures, you know, anything that's floating in the sea. And they come back and feed it to their young, and the young get filled up with plastic. We discussed this a little this morning. Um, and there are these horrendous you know, images, these beautiful images by this uh, chap, Chris Jordan, of these. What happens is you get these bright cans of plastic. And they look you know, very pretty. And then you look again, and you realize that around them is the rotted body of a young albatross. And about a third of them, I think, die every year of simple starvation, or they, 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 they dehydrate to death. And there's something about that that it seems to me, you know, that you watch a, you know, carving glacier, that's terrifying in one way, or when you watch a clear-cut forest, or a, that's terrifying. But there's something about watching parents dutifully, lovingly feed their young poison that I think gets to me more than almost anything else, you know. They're just doing their very best, and yet, you know. So, yeah, this could, I mean, the plastic thing is brilliant. People are getting on board. Um, but um, I think it's... It's a horrible story. Nancy this morning said she can't write about or she, can't, she yeah. didn't want to talk about. Yes, it's been described as hell on earth, but um, I feel I, I really feel compelled to, to go there. Um, again, I'm hoping that it won't be unalloyed darkness, this book, so it should be quite cheerful as well in places. There's a lot of hope as well. Before we read the last poem, 
we would ask some questions. Question for questions from the audience. It's a little bit dark. Maybe we can have more light. I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't see anything. Oh no, I can see. <laughs> but I'm sure after a little while. Yes, please. Where is where is marble now? Ah, this is a very sad story. Um, one of the things about keeping animals, I think, is always the realization that something might happen. Um, goshawks are famously prone to killing themselves by flying into trees. That didn't happen with Mabel. I flew her for six more years, and we became we continued to be friends. I think the term is a good one. Um, and then. Um, I had to go away. I had to go back to my mother's. I had run out of money. <laughs> it was very simple. I couldn't afford to rent my house anymore. My mother lives in the middle of some of the most intensively shot over pheasant sporting estates in Britain. And for some reason, I couldn't find anywhere to fly her. They wouldn't let me. So um, I loaned her to a very dear friend who put her in an aviary so she could, you know, while I worked out where I was going to go, she could just loaf in the sun and fly around. But unfortunately, she died of a fungal infection called aspergillosis. It's a horrible airborne disease, and it kills a lot of wild goshawks too. It's very quick. It was kind of overnight, and um, I wept buckets of tears when I when she died. And I still have um, some of her molted feathers, and uh, we buried her on the hillside where she used to fly. And I still got a little metal band with her ring number on that she was put on. And I, when I'm feeling sentimental, I get out and hold it. I miss it a bit. You know, she was. People talk about having, you know, with dogs, you have the dog of your life, and she was the hawk of my life. I have no question about it. I miss her so much. Sorry. And now you're living with a parrot. What I have a parrot change? now. Yeah, my, friend, my friends tell me it's emotionally more healthy, but I have more scars from my parrot than I ever had from a hawk. You know, if you upset a hawk, it's upset. They're very honest creatures in many ways. They, they can't deceive, you know, so if you upset a hawk, it's upset, and then it'll forgive you. Parrots remember. <laughs> and they're vindictive. I love him. I love my parrot. Such a small bird. M ask my mother. My, he's chased my mother around the house once. It was terrible. And she's, uh, yeah. Another question. Also, can I just say before we, um, thank you so much to you, to the British Council, to everyone involved in this. It's been astonishing, this the whole event. Um, and you've been an amazing audience as well. So thank you so much. But please ask questions. <laughs> Um, I really liked uh, that you said you wanted to write things that a lot of people will want to read. And um, so what, would you, what advice would you give to other scientists who actually want to make use of their research and put that into books that people will want to read? How do you do that? It's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, one of the things I used to, when I was a historian of science, I was very interested in boundary issues in the sciences and the ways in which um, scientists are not allowed to be present as you know, in, in their papers. So, I mean, I would constantly meet the most extraordinary... Right, right. But, I mean, you know, generally. Um, I would meet the most extraordinary um, behavioral psychologists. I would meet, like, animal behaviorists, and they had the most astonishingly passionate relationship to their study objects. And there was so much they felt they couldn't say. Um, I don't know what the answer is. But do tell me about the, 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 you know, the eye in, in scientific papers, if you've got a... Quick, sorry, I'm continuing here. It's a complicated issue anyway, and so we could argue about that for days alone. Let's um, discuss it later. Yes. I would do that. We'll do that. Okay. But yeah, I mean, science no, is a I mean, I look, yeah. I look at science now as a, as a, you know, it's one of the stories we tell about the world. It's an extremely interesting story, and it's extremely useful, and it, and it you know, I want to use the word truth in a kind of, you know, because using the word truth is all kind of like, uh, it's sort of full Trump here. But uh, yeah, it's an incredibly strong way of looking at the world. But there are other ways too, and I, I think that it would be kind of lovely to think about if we're going to describe um, the natural environment in terms of um, ecological, biological, you know, energetics, you know, any kind of, of system, that it would be somehow, I, I just don't know how we can get the, the emotional, those emotional economies that make the natural world so important to those who deal with it. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's some amazing scientist writers. Um, but you didn't really answer my question, did you? Of course I didn't. I haven't answered any of you the questions this evening. <laughs> Sorry, you wanted advice on what? Uh, if you could uh, give any advice uh, to, to scientists or academics, is that if they want to go for something like that, they really want to pursue a book project that will be attractive to a wide audience. Mm -hmm. look, inside your, look inside yourself. Be honest about your emotional engagement and your attachment to the thing that you're studying. Um, readers recognize when you are dissembling. 
Um, when I started this book, actually, the first few chapters, I tried to be a lot less, I tried to be more British about it, and I didn't want to get into the emotions, and I realized that it wasn't going to work. Um, readers have unnerving skills. And if you write something which is plain and honest and deeply um, attached to how you love something, people will respond. It's just as simple as that. And that's true for everything and anyone, because we heard that before this, yes, this afternoon, haven't we? Well, I, it I doesn't make it. No, no. It's, it's of course it's it's completely. Well, should we, should we move on? Let's move into the Thank you. I was I was wondering just the other the opposite side, um, because you're not a biologist, and uh, I was wondering whether any biologist criticized or argued with you about the birds. No, the only the only argument I had was a man who wrote to me and said you got the engines of the uh, airplane wrong, <laughs> and another man who wrote to me and told me that there were not. Airfix models in the 1950s, they, they came later, so um, I hang my head in. But I haven't actually, I haven't had that, and uh, maybe they're still to come. Um, yeah. Any other question? Yes, please. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, you, you spoke uh, in the book and in the extract uh, you gave us this evening. Um, about just how starkly different the physical experiences are for um, for the birds and for humans. Uh, you spoke about um, sort of frames per second and uh, you know, even just the incredible speeds that they can reach. And yet, uh, you speak, uh, you know, in, in the way that you almost felt you were the you were Mabel. And um, I guess my question is, at which at which point did that relationship really become bilateral to the point at which was was there a moment where you really clicked? And and how did you overcome such a incredible? Um, a difference, I suppose. This is a great question. So obviously, I only felt I only really became a hawk in my imagination. I didn't really. I mean, I mean that's obvious. But I mean, I, I, it was a. I was just pretending with all my heart to be like a hawk. I wanted to be solitary. I wanted to be self-possessed. I wanted to have um, no past or future and be this wild thing. I mean, um, but I think yes. Uh, what was the point with Mabel that? Taming a hawk and getting used to it is a very interesting process. Um, again, positive reinforcement. There are a couple of moments where that seem very pivotal. Um, one of them is the first time the hawk looks away from you and then looks back and is, suddenly remembers you're there. One is when, it, when the hawk starts eating from your, from your gloved hand. And one is when the hawk first flies to you. But um, I think I was a very psychologically damaged and desperate person at that point. And I think uh, if I'd had a cat or a dog, probably I would have wanted to be like them. So luckily, um, it wasn't, it was a hawk. But um, do not underestimate how bonkers I was. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, I, 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 people have said to me, you know, my, my a beloved person died and I took solace in my goldfish. You know, it's, the human mind is a magical thing. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, if that, come and come and shout at me afterwards, and we'll discuss some more. There was one here. Hello, I was wondering why you really wanted to read that, write the book. Why? What really got you into it? Because sometimes I felt like it was like you had to finish your story with publishing or writing and finishing your book. So was it grief work, kind of? Is what you're sometimes, sometimes yeah, or yeah. was. Why did you say, well, I had that story with Mabel, but why write it down? Why write it down? Yeah. Yes. It's interesting. So when, when my father died, I started writing um, compulsively. I think it was a kind of way to stitch the world back together in a sort of desperate way to try and make sense of it, to read the world again. And uh, that's why it's called Ages for Hawk. It's a book about learning to read again after everything seems incomprehensible, or one of the reasons. Um, so I kept writing, and then my writing had a hawk in it. And then, sort of, as the year went on, I began to realize that the story had a shape to it that was much older and, and, and bigger than me. You know, it was, a, it was an old story that was somehow being told through what I was doing. And I thought, wow, that was interesting. Um, I might write that one day. But it took me five years to, for there to be enough distance between the events in the book and, and writing it. So that I, I was a character. You know, the, the me in the book is a bit of a jerk, really. I mean, she's a bit dumb and obnoxious, um, and yeah, so it was very strange. I, I could still write the book as if I was a character and Mabel was a character, but something about grief made my recollection of that year crystalline. I mean, I remembered, I remembered everything. In fact, it's quite worrying now. I have a terrible memory. I have to make mo many more notes this time round. Um, but I just 
once you start writing a book, I, I think, well, in my experience, it becomes its, itself. It's a bit like dealing with, again, with a half-wild animal. You know, you, you sort of forget why you're writing it. It's just necessary that it, it be done. Um, it's a really interesting feeling. I miss it. One last question, maybe? Yes, please. As a follow-on to the question you just asked, now you've traveled around for years talking about that book. Do you think that will have an impact on your writing? And how does that make you feel about your writing in retrospect? I've never been asked that. That's amazing. Good question. Um, uh, I don't think that has had an impact necessarily as much as working for a um, United States newspaper um, where there is extreme fact-checking and editorial discussions. Um, so, you know, there's sort of two or three rounds of the piece going in and editorial comments. And I've sort of realized after about, you know, three or four months of being furious and feeling really insecure, this is just a process that happens. It's a collaboration between you and an editor and fact-checkers. And um, I began to realize, you know, that there was a way of writing that made there not so many facts to check. <laughs> so I'd be like, instead of saying, you know, uh, it was, you know, 12 degrees or whatever. I was like, I'm cold. You know, so, it's, yeah, so that, that possibly changed my writing. But, you know, every writing, every kind of writing that you, that I, you know, every kind of style, I, I have no idea how the next book will be. I'm hoping it will be as, um, as personal and as honest as, as that one, just in a different way. It's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering whether you uh, write the Albatross book maybe as fiction? Um, yeah, I think I might I might play a little bit about across that border. So, for example, the, the you know the Hawk book had the T H White material in it, and I don't you know I didn't know T H White. He died before I was born, and I spent a lot of time in the archives. And that material is is as accurate as I could possibly make it, but yet it was still a work of fiction. So I think I'd love to try and trade across that border a bit more, and maybe one day I'll write a novel. <laughs> or maybe so not. you should rush <laughs> a little bit that we get more stuff to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for your, uh, your attention and the audience. Thank, thank you, you for answer our questions or not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and thank you for our last poem. Okay, let's find one that's not too long, because I feel that you poor people have been sitting there for ages. Are you still writing poems? No, I'm not. I should do. Um, I think I actually know what I'm saying now, so I actually just sort of put it in prose. Don't tell anyone I said, oh, no, it's live feed, isn't it? I'm doomed. <laughs> My poet friends are going to get really angry with me. Um, this is just a little kind of poem about... Um, it just, I was a, there's a wonderful nature reserve near me uh, where my mum lives in Selborne, where Gilbert White um, lived and wrote. And there's a place called Nor Hill. And I was walking there once, and um, it was, for no reason at all, a, pheasant, a little pheasant feather just blew past me. And for some reason, that kind of hooked at me, and I wrote a poem about it. Nor Hill. Coruscating over maize, where the buff and silk and scimitar-tipped contour feather buoyed on a strong easterly pass in a second and buried deep in leaves. The memory of skin behind, skin and barbs walking up to the crest of a hill. All the ever wished to invent was there, and that was the end of modesty. Amateur light flapping on grey felt that tugged to the eye like a wing bar, raw chalk and ice underfoot, creased to imagine age where it's soaked gunpowder demeanor, the scent of flint and government prized apart by frost, dropping from the sheer three-foot slope as white mud. A pallor derived from deception at the window stood bitten by river air, the roiling heart, a moment of love only. Chief among these then, and you are calling it in, Inspiration like dry skin in its diminution silence. And the sky is as motionless as the heart it's hooked to tie it from. Thank you.